All right, yeah. More American history. To be fair, it's still from the Jesse James book. I've always I've been into. I always like like cowboy films and stuff, but I never really like knew. I suppose I know a bit about the Civil War and whatever, but and you kind of know a loose, but yeah, not quite the graphic details, but yeah. Then I thought this one as well. This must be the biggest balls up in military history. But again, I kind of I know what happened. He, he charged into loads, but loads of people, but. I don't really, yeah, so hopefully this will explain it a bit better, a bit better, but yeah, Custer's Last Stand, the Battle of Little Bighorn. So yeah, let's go. The years leading up to the Battle of the Little Bighorn were turbulent for Native Americans. Confusing US government policies misled the Plains Indians and led to a series of conflicts between both parties. Seeking to put an end to these turbulent times, the US government guaranteed exclusive possession of the sacred Black Hills and the Dakota Territory west of the Missouri River to the Lakota and Dakota Sioux with the signing of the Second Fort Laramie Treaty in 1868. In 1874, prospectors illegally entered the Great Sioux Reservation and began mining in the Black Hills for gold. Soon after their arrival, they found what they came for when they discovered a large gold deposit at Deadwood Gulch in November 1875. Though, their presence did not go unnoticed by the Lakota, who were furious that the terms of the Second Fort Laramie Treaty had been broken. Realising the potential conflict that would ensue should matters continue to escalate, the US government promptly stepped in and offered to buy the Black Hills off the Lakota, but unwilling to give up their sacred grounds, they refused. Now unable to persuade the Lakota to leave and unwilling to leave the gold deposits alone, the US government sought to remove the Lakota from their lands by issuing an ultimatum on December 6, 1875 to the Indian agencies which read, All Indians are to return to their designated reservations by January 31, 1876, or be deemed hostile. The short time frame set out by the ultimatum made it almost impossible for the Indian hunting parties that were scattered over hundreds of kilometres to return in time, and with many of the Plains Indians rejecting the conditions, confrontation became inevitable. In direct defiance of the US government, the leaders of the Sioux people, Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse, gathered hundreds of Lakota and Northern Cheyenne and made camp along the banks of the Little Bighorn River in southern Montana, at a place they called the Greasy Grass. It was here during the annual Sundance ceremony in early spring of 1876 that Sitting Bull had a vision. In it he saw soldiers toppling upside down into his camp and took it as a sign of a looming great victory for his people. As spring flowed into the early days of summer, more and more Indians left the reservations and joined the camp, and by June of that year, thousands of Lakota, Northern Cheyenne and Arapaho Indians swarmed in the deep ravines of the Little Bighorn Valley. In the spring of 1876, the US government sought to put an end to Sitting Bull and his followers. Thus, they instructed Lieutenant General Sheridan to gather a force and round up those they considered to be hostile. And so, under Sheridan's orders, three army columns were assembled and were to sweep Lakota country 
in an attempt to corral the Indians. The first column under command of Colonel John Gibbons consisted of six companies. It is liberties, really. When you think of it. It's absolute liberties. They are just kicking them out. They're breaking a treaty, just kicking them out because, basically, because there's gold there. Yeah. It's a low move. of the 7th Infantry and four companies of the 2nd Cavalry. Their orders were to march east out of Fort Ellis on March 30th, 1876 and track along the Yellowstone River towards the mouth of the Bighorn Valley. The 2nd Column under the command of Brigadier General George Crook consisted of 10 companies of the 3rd Cavalry, 5 companies of the 2nd Cavalry, 2 companies of the 4th Infantry and 3 companies of the 9th Infantry. From Fort Fetterman they would move north towards the Powder River on May 29th and sweep the Lakota country from the south. Finally, the third column under the command of Brigadier General Alfred Terry would march west out of Fort Abraham Lincoln on May 17th and link up with the other two columns and in the process effectively corral Sitting Bull and his followers. Terry's column would become synonymous with the Little Bighorn as in addition to the Gatling Gun Detachment of the 20th Infantry and two companies of the 17th Infantry, 12 companies of the infamous 7th Cavalry under the command of Lieutenant General George Armstrong Custer were also attached. By this time Custer's 7th Cavalry were renowned for their participation in the campaigns of the American Indian Wars, with their most notable victory coming at the Battle of Washita River in November 1868. However, by the spring of 1876, the well-drilled and battle-hardened companies of the 7th Cavalry were a shadow of their former selves. Some 20% of the troopers were new recruits, with little to no experience of frontier combat. To make matters worse, despite being the best equipped and supplied regiment in the US Army at the time, many of the troopers were malnourished and in poor health. Nevertheless, they marched with General Terry's column in anticipation of winning a decisive victory which would bring about the end of the American Indian Wars. Though, in reality, many of them would ultimately be marching to their early graves. By mid-June, the army's plans began to unravel, as on June 17th, Crook's column was forced to retreat after being dealt a heavy blow by the Indians at the Battle of the Rosebud. To make matters worse, a distinct lack of communication left the other two columns unaware of Crook's retreat and so they proceeded to march on until they linked up at the mouth of Rosebud Creek. It was here that General Terry called for a new plan in which Custer would take the 7th Cavalry south along the Rosebud before striking west to the Little Bighorn Valley. From here, he was to track north along the Little Bighorn River and sweep the Indians up the valley where the joint Terry Gibbon column would be waiting in force. Thus, on June 22nd, 1876, Custer and the 7th Cavalry, which comprised of 31 officers and 566 men, began their reconnaissance along the Rosebud, with the added prerogative that Custer could depart from orders if he saw sufficient reason to. Wishing to pursue the natives with haste, Custer declined the offer to take the Gatling guns with him and set off in pursuit of Sitting Bull's camp. On the evening of June 24th, Indian scouts from Custer's command reached the overlook at Crow's Nest, some 14 miles east of the Little Bighorn River, and at daybreak on the 25th, they had discovered Sitting Bull's camp. Word was immediately passed back to Custer, who rode up and joined them, but when he arrived, neither he nor the officer who was there with him could make sight of the camp. Hell-bent on furthering his reputation, Custer departed from his orders and decided to attack without the aid of the Terry Gibbon column. Drawing on over a decade of frontier combat experience, he planned to attack at dawn on the 26th, but when a small band of Indian warriors sighted some 7th Cavalry troopers, he feared they'd warn the camp and cause the Indians to scatter. Wishing to avoid this, 
Custer went against his own better judgment and hastily decided to attack immediately. Thus, without further delay, the men of the 7th Cavalry rapidly assembled to the call of the bugle and prepared for battle. Custer's plan of attack was to divide his 12 companies into three. It's just one little decision. One little decision caused the death of all the men. Columns. Major Eno would take companies A, G and M and attack the camp head-on from the south, while Custer himself would lead five companies, C, E, F, I and L, and attack the camp from the north. Meanwhile, Captain Benteen would take companies D, H and K and sweep south, cutting off the Indian retreat, whilst a smaller fourth detachment, under the command of Captain McDougall, would take B Company and escort the slow-moving pack train. On their approach, in broad daylight on June 25th, 1876, the 7th Cavalry came across a lone teepee which contained the body of the Sands Ark warrior, Old She-Bear, where he had been mortally wounded at the Battle of the Rosebud just a few days earlier. This landmark would gain huge significance as it was here that Custer gave Reno his final orders and it would also be the last time many of the men would see some of their comrades alive as the three columns began their approach. As the 7th Cavalry prepared to attack that day, they were operating under the assumptions that Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse had no more than 800 warriors at their disposal. But these numbers, supplied by the US Army's own Indian agents, failed to take into account the large numbers of reservation Indians who had unofficially left the reservations to join the camp that spring. Thus, unknowingly, Custer faced a force comprising of some 1,500 to 2,500 warriors and not the 800 he had anticipated. The first to realize this blunder was Major Reno, whose command had crossed the Little Bighorn River at Reno Creek around 3 p.m. Upon sighting the southern end of the camp, Reno ordered an all-out charge, but almost immediately he realized the Indians were present in force. As Reno approached the camp, he quickly sent his Crow Indian scouts forward to protect his exposed left flank, and as the rest of the battalion swept around the bend in the river, the full expanse of the camp came into sight for the first time. Now, for the first oh, time, Reno yeah. realised they had made a grave error, and fearing he would... Uh, Joe from the Sopranos, in it, General Custer's last thoughts. Someone painted it, and they're like, how's that General Custer's last thoughts? All it is is a cow with a halo over its head, and a load of Native Americans making love. Uh, how is that Custer's last thoughts? Oh, well, holy cow, look at all them fucking Indians. He <laughs> surrounded and trapped if he entered the camp. He promptly halted the charge a few hundred yards from the camp entrance and yelled at his troopers to dismount and form skirmish line. Anchoring the right flank of the line to the river, Reno's men began pouring volley after volley into the masses of warriors now streaming out of the camp. However, the skirmish line formation reduced Reno's firepower by 25%, as every fourth trooper in line had to hold the horses for his comrades. Exploiting this weakness, the warriors rode head-on against Reno's centre and exposed left flank, and after some 20 minutes of firing, the odds began to stack heavily against Reno and his men. Soon after, some 500 warriors who had massed behind the cover of a hill to Reno's left launched an all-out assault against his flanks. Realising his position was untenable, Reno ordered a withdrawal to the cover of the brush near the river. Here, with more cover, the troopers of the 7th Cavalry put up stiffer resistance, until the Indians attempted to set fire to the dead wood and burn them out. In the ensuing chaos, Reno, who was clearly shaken, ordered his men to mount, dismount, and then mount again, before finally yelling to anyone in earshot, all those who wish to make their escape, follow me. The retreat descended into utter carnage as the fractured elements of the columns scrambled back across the river. 
those who were lucky enough to still have their horses, attempted to aid their wounded comrades, but the brutality of close quarters combat hindered their attempts. Eventually, at around 4.20pm, the ragged remains of Reno's command, who had made it atop Reno Hill, were reinforced by Captain Benteen's column arriving from the south. Benteen's command had been summoned by Bugler Giovanni Martino, who was carrying what would be Custer's final written order, which simply said, Benteen, come on, Big Valley, be quick, bring packs. P.S. Bring packs. It was around this time Reno and Benteen could hear heavy gunfire coming from the north, and it was likely that at this point, Custer and his command were already dug in around Last Stand Hill. However, now grasping the gravity of the situation, Benteen decided not to ride to Custer, but instead he chose to remain and reinforce Reno's crippled command. Thus, when McDougal's B Company arrived with the pack train, Benteen ordered the 14 officers and 340 troopers at his disposal to dig rifle pits and set up an all-round defensive perimeter. Despite this, Captain Thomas Weir and D Company left the defensive perimeter at around 5pm and rode north in an attempt to reach Custer's command. As they reached Weir Point, some one mile north of Reno Hill, they witnessed warriors firing at objects on the ground. It was widely believed that they were witnessing the conclusion of Custer's battle at Last Stand Hill at about 5.25pm. Although, other sources now claim that what Weir was actually witnessing was the destruction of L and C Company around Calhoun Hill. The remaining companies at Reno Hill eventually followed Weir and D Company, but growing attacks around Weir Point forced them back to their original position. Now entrenched and exhausted, the weary troops hung on and fended off ferocious attacks. At some point during the defence, Benteen would earn praise from his men for personally leading a counter-attack to drive off a group of warriors massing in the long grass. It's crazy. Again, just how much violence America is born from is, is crazy. But you just see, like, It's, it's mad as well to um, sit in Bull, is it? Had a vision of it. And literally his vision pretty much come true. But yeah, you're seeing like... It's, there's an arrogance to it as well, thinking like... All the signs is there that you're not going to win. In every step you're like getting caught out. To just pack up and go home. But hold on two secs. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking, to be fair, Custer's been remembered very harshly by history because it weren't just him that got smashed. They all got smashed. Like, they all made stupid decisions. It's funny that it seems to be the him that's remembered. But anyway, let's go. Unfolded for Custer and his. Therefore, the following details of Phoenix is based on the details of the battle made by Phoenix. With the bulk of Reno's command pinned down in the brush at around 3.30pm, the bulk of Indian warriors were free to pursue Custer whose command was now climbing the bluffs on the opposite banks of the river. From a high vantage point Custer was able to see Reno's command and ordered his men north where they could ford the river and attack the northern end of the camp in a classic hammer and anvil manoeuvre. As Custer's men charged north, they attempted to ford the river at the Medicine Tail Ford in the belief that this was the doorway to the northern end of the camp. But to their absolute horror, they quickly realised that they'd underestimated the size of the camp and in reality, they were attacking the middle. With a hail of arrows and bullets raining down on Custer's command, 
he promptly turned tail and headed further north along the bluffs. By the time Custer and his command made it to Calhoun Hill, the situation had become dire. The Indians had all but surrounded the troopers, and now their superiority in numbers began to show. Heavy fire from sharpshooters to the southeast made it impossible for Custer's men to secure a full defensive position around the hill. With casualties rapidly mounting and the Indians closing in, Custer and companies F, E and I made a break for Last Stand Hill, leaving L and C companies to fight it out on Calhoun Hill. The move proved disastrous, as I Company were caught out in the open by a handful of Oglala Sioux, who had tracked northeast along the bluffs and attacked them in the rear. E Company did not fare any better, as they attempted to make a desperate dash off Last Stand Hill to the river. However, in what the Indians described as a buffalo run, the scattered troops were picked off and slaughtered. This left only some 50 to 60 men of F Company still standing with Custer at Last Stand Hill, and as they witnessed the waves of warriors appearing from all sides, they must have realised any hopes of survival were futile. Those who could attempted to form skirmish line, but the sheer panic they experienced meant any army doctrine was thrown out the window in a desperate scramble for survival. Indian accounts reveal that the last few survivors of F Company put up a ferocious resistance and inflicted many casualties. However, it is believed that when Crazy Horse himself led a charge against F Company's right flank, any remnants of the skirmish line was shattered and the company was overwhelmed. At some point during this final stand, Custer himself was fatally shot below the heart, which may explain the rapid descent into panic of those left on Last Stand Hill. A few hundred yards to the south on Calhoun Hill, L and C Company were hanging on by a thread clinging to the glimmer of hope that Benteen's column would arrive. Though, as the last troopers of F Company were overrun, their hopes dwindled, and at around 5.25pm, as their ammunition supplies dried up, they were finally overwhelmed. Jesus. In a way, you can say, do you know what I mean? It does serve you right. You started a fight, but on the other hand, it's just a, what a waste of life. Do you know what I mean? Over really gold. That's what that is over. And men that, and ev like every man that fought in that, is not ever gonna have the benefits of that gold anyway. As the Battle of the Little Bighorn concluded, the bodies of all 210 officers and troopers that had followed Custer to the northern reaches of the camp littered the landscape. Among the dead were two of Custer's brothers, Boston and Thomas, his brother-in-law James Calhoun, and his nephew Henry Reed. In addition, a further 58 men of the 7th Cavalry perished during Reno's charge and the subsequent defence of Reno Hill bringing the total dead to 268 men, with a further 55 wounded. Native losses are harder to determine, with many people estimating the losses to be just 31 killed. However, Lakota Chief Red Horse stated in 1877 that he believed native losses could be estimated at around some 136 killed and up to 160 wounded. Two days after the battle on June 27, 1876, General Terry's column arrived at the battlefield. Unaware of what had unfolded, Terry was quickly briefed that Custer's command had been wiped out. As news began to filter out about the battle, accusations about who was to blame were promptly thrown about. Many tried to lay blame on Captain Benteen for deciding not to reinforce Custer, but in the long years since the battle, many historians and military personnel agree that Benteen's actions that day probably saved the lives of all remaining companies from total destruction. Ultimately, Custer shouldered the blame as his decision to split his force with poor intelligence led to the total destruction of five companies of the 7th Cavalry. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe, leave a like and share. 
And if you'd like to learn more about... That's crazy. Crazy. Yeah, I'd imagine that there'd be more Native Americans killed than that. Than 31. Because, yeah. I mean... Although they got slaughtered, the slaughtering still took a while. Do you know what I mean? It still took them to the point of running out of ammo. A certain amount of them. So you would think that they'd have took out a lot more than 31. But yeah. Think of it. Just a minute. That's what, like... They did do a good job. I'm guessing that what he was using as clips was the, was a film of it. But yeah, think of being in that fight and then like looking up and just seeing a whole here yeah, unit of Native American. Yeah, it's crazy. They all died though. Yeah. I know it has really been painted as if white people bullied, which obviously there is an element of that. But do you know what I mean? They it weren't like they like history kind of makes the Native Americans seem weak. But that fight was like what over five hundred years it took. Which is a long ass time. But yeah. Yeah. Savage. But it is fascinating these things. Fascinating. But yeah. That's the reactions. <laughs>